Hi and welcome to a very special The Northman spoiler special episode of We Needed Roads. And David, just like Prince Amleth at the gates of hell, I'm sweating my balls off today. But thankfully for you and our viewers and listeners, I'm not completely naked. But much like an early raid, I am sat in my pants. Yes, dear listener, be great. That was one bit, sorry. There weren't any balls. What? I was disappointed that there weren't any genitals during that fight. I mean, it was quite dark, you know. Yeah, but nothing at all. They were like action figures. It was like action man fighting. It was almost like they was just cut off. Dear listener, be grateful that we don't do video podcasts. Otherwise, you would want to follow Bjork's career path as an eyeless seer. But perhaps, right, perhaps that's why she went blind, David. Who knows? Anyway, say it with us. Avenge father. Save mother. Kill David's I bad Viking jokes. I don't have any. I was going to say, what Viking-inspired bad jokes do you have for us today? No, I thought they were retired, weren't they? Or did I, did I bring them back? Was I allowed to bring them you back? You made a big song and dance about retiring, and then a week later you did one, and then you... Haven't been doing them, not because they're not funny, because they're not. It's just because you keep forgetting to do them. I, I do forget to do them. I knew this was going to happen. So I have prepared some Viking puns myself, David. Ooh. And you just, just they are so bad that Odin himself would be angry. So first of all, where does a Viking keep their baby? Uh, in, a, in a norsing home. In a, in a, in a, in a nursery, yeah. Okay. Oh, God. I was so close with that one. How do Vikings communicate over long distances? Yarl, yarl hala, yarling, yarl, yarl, y- yelling, something, something to do with yarl hala, yelling, and no, nope, nope, damn it, no, nope. Norse code. Oh, uh, I reckon my one was just as good. No, your one I saw, and it's um, what do redneck Vikings say to each other? What, yarl, yarl hala, yarl. <laughs> what did the Viking chief say when asked about his motivation? Oh, go on, I can't think of one for this. I'm in it for the long haul. Oh, no, that was boring. Uh, you want to talk? What kind of truck does a Viking drive? Uh, <laughs> wow, can't I've have gone. that there, David. I've gone. A go fjord. A, a, f- a fjord. A fjord. Uh, it's so obvious now. And I think you'll probably get this one. Where do old Vikings go? Old Vikings. Going to a Norsing home. Yes! So Norsing home. That's what I said earlier, yeah. No, that's a Norsery. For the uh, do the Norsing home. Yeah, 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 yeah. And finally, what is a Viking's favourite music? <laughs> Bjorn. Nope. Ragnarok. Ragnarok. Uh... Well, that's it. We could go on for hours. What do you call a Viking that's been bitten by a vampire? I, I, I saw it and it was terrible. Norse Ferrati. Yep. No, stop. You've just been Googling while I've been doing that and looking these up now, aren't you? No, yes. you, t- you take the piss out of me when I type. I know, I do. You have a go at me. I can hear the pitter patter of tiny fingers. Yeah, well, I wasn't then. So you did have a joke, you just forgot it. No, that's just. Ke- I just made that up. You didn't make it up, I've seen it. Ah, i just joking, yeah, I did have one, I forgot. Good it. God. Right, well, uh, <laughs> after all that fr- frivolity, we are here to discuss at length the one film that me and David actually managed to agree on on our top 10 most anticipated films of the year list. And I believe The Northman was our second most anticipated film for both of us. Was it? I thought it was number one for us both. What no. was number one for us both? Your number one was Disappointment Boulevard. Disappointment Boulevard. We don't even yeah, have an yeah. image or a trailer from yet, and you know nothing about, yeah. which is why I break you over the yeah. coals on that one. And my number one was... I don't need to know anything more. And my... You're an idiot. And my other one... And yours was Fall, Love and Thunder. Yeah. yeah. So the other Norse film right. of the year, but with, you know, more spaceships. So let's get going, David, because it's Grim Up North. Now, The Northman, which opened Friday the 15th of April here in the UK, a full week before the States, not that we're gloating, but we are going to gloat a little bit because it goes a little bit of the way to making it better for the fact that whenever there's a brand new HBO Max show, like Peacemaker, like Our Flag Means Death, like, not even HBO Max, um, like The Halo Show on Paramount Plus, we have to wait fucking months for it. And you only have to wait a week. So, sorry, we got to see it first. Woohoo. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. Sorry, not sorry, yeah. Um... But if we sh- should we apologise to all of them? Because this is going to be spoilery, right? So if they have not seen it and won't be able to see it... Right time, at the very start of my opening line, I did say, this is a very special The Northman spoiler special. Yeah, yeah. No, I know, I know. But if we're going to release it before they can even have a chance to see it and we're going to spoil it for these people... I mean, it will say in big letters on the website, spoiler special. Spoiler. I think it'll be quite clear to people that... We haven't spoiled anything yet, but we're going to. We're going to get into it. We're going to give away all the, the twists. And I mean, there's not many twists in that, to be fair. It's kind of only one. Yeah, kind of one. And you saw it and I didn't. So you can get to gloat about that a little bit later. But 
Uh, the Northman is an epic Viking revenge saga, and it's the third film by acclaimed director Robert Eggers. Now, before we saw the film, we did speculate quite a bit if this film was being slightly mismarketed, uh, though understandably to increase the amount of box office, right? Because Eggers' previous films, The Witch and The Lighthouse, are both now pretty much revered as, you know, classic genre films, even though they're quite new. But having said that, even a few years into their filmic lives of these first two films, I would I wouldn't say they're what you would call an easy watch either of them. The lighthouse certainly. No, isn't. <laughs> no. the light. Yeah, Natasha quite literally just stopped paying attention halfway through. Yeah, she was like on her phone looking at sausage dog videos. When I um first saw the lighthouse, I was like, I know everyone's raving about it, but I don't get it, and I'm bored. And then I watched it again uh, about six months later, and I then it just clicked. I got it. I was like, okay, yeah, it's genius. I think that's the thing with Venegas' film. No matter what he does now, I think he's one of these directors, like your famed Ari Aster as well, that whatever they make, even if you don't initially warm to it, you're like, no, this is, you know it's going to be brilliant. I mean, when I saw The Witch in the cinema a few years back, there was about three people in the cinema. And arguably, it did have quite a divisive ending, shall we say, that very divided audiences. And uh, what Eggers does, he does subtle menace very well. And you can argue that the slow methodical build-up in The Witch doesn't really give you that full release as well at the end of the film. Now, his second film, The Lighthouse, was one of those classic films that when I first watched it, like I said, I couldn't decide whether it was utter crap or a masterpiece. But it did stay with me, because I kept thinking about like some bizarre images in that. And, like you know, just William Dafoe and Patterson's performances. There, were, there was really bizarre, funny stuff in it. And so I watched it again, and like I said, I did love it. I mean, it's stark black-and-white portrayal of men gone mad with classic Lovecraftian illusions throughout it. It's a simple do-hander, but it has to say, it's got amazing performances by Pattinson and Defoe. And I think it does. it's one of these films that it does improve on its legend with repeated viewings. Now, The Northman is Egger's third film and his biggest budget to date. The Witch only cost a paltry $4 million and made $40 million, so quite a good uh, payback on that one. While The Lighthouse cost $11 million, but only made $18 million back, despite more acclaim. Now, The Northman cost an estimated $90 million, and is easily the biggest film of his career so far. And as we speculated beforehand, would it gain that massive crossover audience as the advertising is hoping, seeing as bus posters are billing it as this generation's gladiator, or will it more likely be this year's group? I haven't seen that advert anywhere. I have literally, if you look at... You mentioned that twice to me, and I've not seen it. If you look at both buses, right, man, there's buses with it on, and it just says, this generation's gladiator. Is that a quote from a review? It must be. That sounds like something that someone would quote like as a review and that's what they're using for marketing material. No, but I, I would say it sounds like something they might... Well, it probably is, but it's probably something they said themselves as well, purely because it, they want it to be a crossover hit, right? And here's the thing. like You look at last year's Green Knight. Now, objectively, that's another five-star classic of a film that is only going to... Over the years, people are more going to discover it. Now, Green Knight wasn't five-star film. No, I think, I think it was. What's you? Four then? Four? Three. Okay, woo. Three, four. They're, they're yeah, going to take away your art house cinema um, past. It wasn't as good as the, it wasn't as good as this. Oh well, so no. if you was both saying that both are five stars, then surely the Northmans are six. Well, no, you know, no, you can't. You can have five star films for different levels of decency. Can you? What's the point? Well, then the whole ranking system just goes out. Of, you oh. know, Neil, this is we've had this problem before with you and your rankings. You're a ranker, but look, one thing that I'm trying to get across with this whole Green Knight comparison is. It's a film that critics loved and got really strong critical reviews. And, you know, in filmic circles, everyone loved it. But it wasn't, well, it wasn't a box office hit because it went straight to streaming in the UK. But if it had been a regular, a regular year without pandemic and that, I still don't think it would have done that well. Because, like you say, it looks like, a you know, oh, it's going to be like a fantasy film. And it's quite slow and mental. I think The Northman is kind of similar way. It does have a lot more action in it. And as I think we mentioned, the success of Spider-Man showed people will really risk getting coronavirus just to see a great film on a big screen. So the real point is, will it be a massive hit to liken it to Gladiator and be a crossover hit? Or will it be like The Green Knight and get great reviews, but not really connect to the wider audience? What do you think, David? It will be a cross between the two. It won't get as much money as uh, Gladiator will. Uh, it will get the critical acclaim Gladiator will. Well, it already has. I think. <laughs> and Well, yeah, yeah, there you go. And it will... Um, viewed within circles like the green knight has been yeah but it won't it won't get as much money as gladiator will or did 
Well, I mean, obviously, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic now, so there wasn't many when we saw it the other night, was there? So, um, I mean, it was it was a decent, uh, it was a, it's an okay show. It was decent. It was, it a was decent. 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 Then again, there were only two viewings that day on opening night. Mm. Cinema had only showed it twice, which is a bit of a concern, isn't it? Mm. I know some people were cons- were concerned that we was even going to get it, you know, in this neck of the woods. And I know from Twitter, other people were saying, "Oh, we, wow, we've actually got it." I know someone had to go and see the Lost City because they're low. Local. Oh, fucking hell, that's a good beer. I'm having a brew dog, Dead Pony Club. Fucking hell, that's really nice. Yeah, but David, are you drinking it from a horn or a foot? I can pretend to. Okay. Just imagine that. Imagine that. And it's not brew dog, it's a horn of mead. Mm. Although you are going to have a bit of problem with the feast being a vegetarian, because, you know, I don't think that... The Dead Ponies... Dead ponies come up. That's quite That's quite relevant. Well, firstly, let's take a look at the basic plot of the film, which Eggers has said is based a little bit on the Nordic legend of Amleth, which in turn Shakespeare then used as a basis for his masterwork Hamlet. And of course, if you know Hamlet or The Lion King, David, then you know how the story goes. Um, Alexander Starsgard plays Prince Amleth, son of King Irvendil Warraven, played by Ethan Hawke, and his mother Queen Gudrun is played by Nicole Kidman. Returning pretty injured from a recent campaign, it's clear King Ethan will not be around too long, and he begins to make preparations to get his son Amleth ready for the brutal life that is ahead of him, as he's still quite wide-eyed and innocent at this point. And before you know it... How does he do that, Neil? Well, they they, they go and... They pretend they pretend to they pretend to be dogs. They pretend to be dogs. and Where they're, they're barking about, like... Ruff, ruff, yeah. And crawling around. That's that's what they do, man. They're... And they've got to prove that they're uh, human by farting and burping. A lot of farting and burping. Yep, I'm... Um, I'm not going to lie, that made absolutely zero sense to me, that part of the film. Maybe it was quite, like, riddled within actual what happened. But I don't know, I don't know how historically accurate that was, but I liked it. And, uh, well, you had William Defoe there as the guy telling them how... Was it William Defoe there? Mm-hmm. Heim- as Heimdall. Yeah, he was. He was the Rafiki. He's Rafiki. Or is Bjorn Rafiki. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, before you know it, Dracula himself, TV's Dracula, that is, Class Bang... The brothers, the king's brother, Fjornoy, chops his head off and tries to murder young Amleth. Amleth makes a run for it with his little dinghy and swears over and over again that he will avenge you, father, save you, mother, and kill Uncle Fjornoy. Well, family gatherings are going to be fun. We then jump forward several years later to a full-grown Amleth, who is now a full-grown Viking berserker and general all-round killing machine, who was kind of lost... Yeah, that kid that kid filled out, didn't he? Yeah. You wouldn't have thought that kid would fill out like that. <laughs> like... As a child actor, he looks pretty uh, slim and pretty kind of wimpish with his little crop, like bowl cut hair. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, I am amazed that kid survived. Innocent Menina. The, the bit where uh, his uncle says, bring me the boy's head. I was like, yeah, this kid, I mean, you know he's not going to die. But you like, you look at him like there was like little curtains haircut. You're like, oh, mate, you're you're dead. You're dead. And he chops off the guy's nose. Like the guy's trying to get him. Yep. Chops the nose off. That's his first kind of, you know action that we we see him in yeah how does that how do they do that did the for the rest of the film did that guy just walk around with a little green sock on his nose no they chopped his nose off for real david you know it's hard hard film <laughs> well there's no there was either two ways right they the bloke either just doesn't have a nose i don't know because i don't remember the actor or he was they, all the actors just walked around with a little green sock in every scene i'm at which point how any actor managed to c- take that seriously is you know, bro. Because it's because it's called acting, so it's literally their job to not laugh. I would have oh, well, that, yeah, well, that's why they get the big bucks. And yeah, then... well, say you were the camera guy, man. You're the camera operator, and you're like, oh, oh, he's got a green sock. You'd be fired within your first day, man. It's funny though. Uh, anyway, as we say, he's now a full-grown killing machine, but he's kind of lost his way a little bit on his mission of vengeance, and it's only a chance meeting with Bjork's unnamed witch character that sets Amleth back on his path of vengeance. And boy, David, do we get vengeance! Vengeance. I'm vengeance. I'm vengeance. Sorry, I was trying to do my Batman. Yeah, well, I, I think Amleth was probably could do a better Batman voice than uh, Bruce Wayne. I've still got my little Batman guy here, by the way. Oh, my God. <laughs> that I, I was literally worried you was going to just be focused on that the whole time rather than the film. So we have to explain this quickly then. David bought a Batman Slurpee bobblehead cup. And literally the whole way through the trailers, he was like, look at it, look at it, look at it. What's happening? <laughs> It's so stupid, though. It's like, oh, that's the best five pounds I've ever spent. The thing is, aren't they supposed to be reusable? So, aren't like, you supposed to bring that back next time? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm bringing it back. I'm going to start collecting them. If they, if that's a thing that City World do, I'm, I'm collecting. They've them. done it for years, man. With like certain big films, Have they are. Oh, there's behind been Star all Wars ones. Films. There's been Marvel ones. There's been. Oh, I'm going to have to get the Star Wars and this. I'm going to have to look into these. Oh, there'll be some. Go- 
selling it on eBay for double the amount you paid. Yeah, and why would you... Uh, anyway, anyway, anyway. Anyway. Getting off track, because we're here to talk about the Northmen and not your new weird obsession with Slurpee Cups. Let's talk that opening raid, David, where the Vikings attack a woefully unprepared village, which starts with Amleth catching a spear that's thrown to him and then throwing it at a ridiculous distance to just impale someone on a rampart. Uh, then the Vikings run rampant, slaughtering almost all the men and taking the rest of the women for slaves, but not before they throw all the children in the hut, burn it to the ground, Yep, this is the kind of film where burning to death a large amount of children is perfectly acceptable. Yep, that's cool. That's that. Yeah, we had that straight away at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, we're not what? Where they're just like, yeah, take the kid into the burning house. That's fine. And leave him locked in there, burn the house. That's nice. At least they didn't click into, you know, burning down the house there, you know, because that would have been bad. Yeah, our man wolf, um, our man wolf, Amleth. He, uh, he, he's been working on that javelin throw, hasn't he? That was a pretty fucking hardcore <laughs> entrance for him. Well, what made me laugh is they're there with their, like, you know, their wolf hats on, you know, well, actual wolves on. And they're, like, you know, kind of just getting a bit. And then they, like, the people see them. So, like, they clearly didn't sneak that well. <laughs> and then um, they, throw, they throw the shoes off. And they're literally just in, like, big nappies. And it's weird because having watched, like, you know, the Vikings TV show and the new one, Vikings Valhalla, Lost Kingdom, and Last Kingdom and all that kind of stuff. I was like, I don't remember them fighting in nappies sumo style so much. But hey, do you know what? I, I guess it was a thing. Uh, I, 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 I'm guessing that for realism, these... They don't need no protection, man. The, the Norsemen. They're hard. You could compare... You compare... Look at them now, these men, these specimens of human beings in the nappies... And the six packs and pecs, and you look. They've got six packs. They've got about twenty four like packs. Me, me and you, and it's you know what you don't feel good about yourself <laughs> afterwards. That that raid I thought was going to be all one shot. So do you know after they throw the thing and then it's, it's going to track the way through, and then the camera as it yeah I thought I thought it was going to be all one sort of thing, but it, they obviously didn't do that. The that it was pretty fucking brutal though, where they sort of gathered all the village people. Up into the um, into the barn and just fucking burnt them down. Yeah, and it was a good way of setting up Amleth as a character. Though he's not the fucking he ain't the good guy. Though we set that up pretty early into his yeah. adulthood. That Amleth's not a good guy. He's he's a fucking. So your uncle killed your old man. At this point, it's like you've done a lot worse already, man, than that. Mm. Right? You literally just you know murdered. Hundred percent. He... So he kind of um, establishes early on. You're like, oh well. He's supposed to be the hero, but how we're not. He's literally just helped torture. You know, I mean, he doesn't look happy about like the burning children. You know, but he also he doesn't look sad really either. If anything, he looks kind of content with it. So, oh, you know, it's just another just like another Wednesday. Blood splattered fucking <clears throat> pose that he's got. There was on. a lot of like um, in, wasn't there? In it, yeah, there was a lot of screaming. They were very good at I it. Mean, yeah. Well, after after he raids the village, he overhears one of his peeps who are taking slaves onto a boat that's heading for Iceland. And during that time, they say he he he's, he understands that the his uncle who took his kingdom uh, was all of a sudden ousted by was it who was it the oust what country uh, he was ousted by another he's king. And was, he's basically become a, a, a glorified farmer. Yeah, he uh, living in Iceland. He essentially, he was a really crap Thanos. Yeah, 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 and he become he becomes a glorified farmer. So he um, feigns being a slave, burns him, scores himself with a little uh, slave mark, and heads off to uh, Iceland. a slave ship heading for Iceland yeah. with uh, Anna Taylor Joy. Yeah, bumps bumps into Anya on the way. Well, she's Olga in this, and she's a slave girl as well. Yeah, his whole idea is he's now gonna because he kind of like you say he kind of like I was like well he's been rampaging and pillaging for quite a bit from from what we learn at the start. And then it's only when he kind of bumps into uh, Bjork in her one scene cameo, where she's kind of like, "Yep, I've got no eyes," and you're, and she literally tells him, "This is where you're gonna fight. This is where how it's gonna happen." And he just kind of doesn't even think about like actually trying to make it happen earlier on. But it's only when she sees them, he kind of puts him back on the path. Then he's like, "Okay, I'm actively now gonna engage in my yeah, quest." There, there was a lot of these Nor- like Norse visions, aren't there, that happen throughout, like when he's a boy. He sees the what's the tree called? When after after he's pretended being a dog with his dad, he sees the you, the tree, which is the like it's called the heart tree in the film, isn't he? They don't actually refer to it as, but it's basically a lineage, isn't it? The lineage of all his ancestors that have connected him to becoming the the king one day, and it's basically his big family tree. 
Um, what I was going to say, man, if you've if you've ever watched the Vikings or uh, any of like the big Viking shows, like the last game that have been on team. Okay, so one thing I think the Northman absolutely doesn't do is give you any time explaining the lore of the Vikings and its surrounding mythology and uh, the gods stuff to do with the gods. They're just like. This is it. If you don't know about it, tough shit. Stunning, yeah. Stunning visuals, and you either know it or you don't. Yeah. And I mean, I was okay because I've watched all the seasons of Viking, and so I got the references. But if you've never watched it before, then you might be wondering, what is a Valkyrie? What is Valhalla? Who was that dude with the ravens? And what the hell is a big tree? Well, I can tell you, David. A Valkyrie is kind of like a female Norse Grim Reaper, which in the old Norse means chooser of the slain. And they would serve Odin, and they'd be sent to battlefields to choose the slain, that were worthy of a place in Valhalla. And Valhalla is the mythical great hall in Asgard, ruled by Odin, where half of the dead warriors go to you know, chill out and drink for all eternity, and the other half are taken by the goddess Freya for the field of Fjolkvanger. And I have no idea if I pronounced that correctly, or even what the field of Fjolkvanger is, because there's a shitload of Norse mythology on Wikipedia. What is a big tree, David? Well, that is Yggdrasil, and in Norse mythology, that is the world tree, a giant ash tree supporting the whole universe, with its roots extending into Niflheim, the underworld, another to Jotunheim, the land of the giants, and the third branch going into Asgard, the home of the gods. And so, like you see, as we keep seeing this tree during the film, like you said, it's showing you he's getting closer to his journey's end as he's going. He's progressing, he's progressing further through it as we see. So yeah, there's your brief little bit of Norse mythology. If you want to get a bit more into yeah. Norse mythology, I would recommend heartily Neil Gaiman's Norse mythology. Because obviously Neil Gaiman... I've, I've already got it. Same, man. same, man. Uh, yeah, so that kind of yeah. keeps keys you in yeah, a little bit. Me. By this stage in the film, he's kind of... Amleth's kind of... He's working as a slave and he's kind of scoping it out and he's planning when he's going to like kill his uncle and save his mother and avenge his father. All, all, the, all the good stuff. And uh, he bumps into another seer, doesn't he? Uh, I can't remember this guy's name, but he's a he-witch, David. Yeah, I know, I, yeah. Where he's, where he's got um, William Defoe's head. Yeah, so William Defoe... William Defoe talks... I mean, essentially, essentially, that's, that was one thing. I, like, you've got all these big posters, right, for all these big actors in the film. A lot of them aren't really in it much at all, really. William Defoe had three scenes. He had three Did scenes. He? he had the first he... ever scene where he pretended his penis was something. <laughs> he, like, slapped his leather penis. And it was a bit like that was the first, that was his introduction. Yeah. The second one where he's telling people to be a dog, yeah. and then the third one where he's just a, a severed head, he's a dead head. Yeah, and it's a voice. I mean, over. I think arguably we could say um, it's two scenes he had because I don't think that was his actual severed head. I mean, he's a method actor man, but I don't think even Defoe would take it that far. And like you say, Bjork, she literally has about two lines, or maybe a little bit more, just explaining to him. Uh, she's she's got one scene and she pops up as like the O, doesn't she, for the rest of it? It's just who? What? Or just like random flashes of her? Well, very rarely. I, I, I think that was the only time we see her. But again, there's so much like bizarre imagery that crops up in this. Proper, pure Eggers, as it were. But yeah, like I say, you've got Bjork as a, as a really creepy Slav witch character. Hawk's not in it for long. He gets to come in. Oh, I'm really wounded. Ow, it hurts. Ow, it hurts. Oh, I'm just going to train my son how to be a, a dog. And It wasn't like that at all. He's a little bit like that. It wasn't like that. No, he was not like, ow, it hurts. He was like, oh, it's just a scratch. I'll be fine. Yeah. I need to teach the boy how to be a man. Before, before I die of die, horrible wounds. I'm die in battle with sword in my hand. He was, he was, he was like, he was purposely done that way because he was purposely meant to be seen awesome from our perspective. To, sh to, um, because we're seeing it from, from the boy's exactly from perspective, which will be important. Who's besotted with him later on. Yeah, who's who's absolutely besotted with him. Yeah, he like looks up. Um, his, well, there's that shot, isn't it? Like he's like he's here. Where he's looking up at his dad, and he's just yeah. Well, when they're eating, and he's just looking up at his his dad in his um in his throne. Yeah, or whatever the Norse one's called, and he's he's just like he's starstruck almost by his old man. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, then, you know, they come back from mean dogs and boom, a couple of arrows and here comes Uncle Dracula to chop his head off. Yep. One thing I was going to say, Anya Taylor-Joy, right, obviously one of her very earliest roles was in Robert Eggers' first film, The Witch. And the funny thing with The Witch is you're not actually sure if she's a witch or not till the end. And then even then it's a bit kind of, is she, isn't she? What's going on? We're not sure. Uh, they leave it clearly unclear, if that makes any sense. But in this one, she, well, ambiguous. yeah, that's the word I was looking for. Clear, I, I clearly meant to say clearly unclear, not. Yeah, ambiguous is the word. <laughs> um, but in this film, she actually is a witch. So I was like, that's a kind of a nice little comeback role, isn't it? You know, apparently I, I read an interview. She actually wanted to be in the lighthouse. And he's like, well, it's just two guys in the lighthouse. She goes, you got a mermaid. He's like, you don't want to be that mermaid. 
<laughs> and then she's like, oh, yeah. He's just like, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, he, fair play, fair play there. Fair play to Robert Eggers there. I mentioned to you nudity. Um, what, what are they called? The people that come on set to be nudity. Um, oh, uh, in, intimacy co- coordinators. Co- intimacy coordinators. Thank yeah. you. That that it's it's bon- it's bonkers how you can perpe- like purposely move the camera in certain ways with angle like uh, motions that will cover someone's nipples so you don't actually ever see anybody naked at any point. Really, it's just they're naked on screen, but you don't actually ever see anything. Um, well, because I always thought that was quite clever. Well, I mean, I don't think it, I don't think it's anything to do with being clever these days, man. Because I mean, like I don't think this film was worried about the rating. I mean, we looked right; the rating is a fifteen. How what? the rating fucking bonk? Yeah, I don't How? understand film ratings, mate. <laughs> I don't understand it. I said to you, didn't I, after the film? Well, I'd watched Fresh recently. Fresh is an eighteen. How the fuck Fresh is an eighteen, and this is a fifteen? It does. I, I don't. I don't understand. Where was the line? Where's the line drawn? In that, I don't understand. I it. mean, I think the line usually is anything that's uh, to do with sexual violence. Usually, is one or um, the c word. Well, do you know, even the c word gets away with it because um, Shaun of the Dead was a fifteen, and uh, that's literally one of the opening lines in it. Can I get any of you a drink? Mm. So I think it's more to do with uh, violence. I uh, get in that in that type of thing is kind of what they look at that look down and gets that immediate eighteen rating these days or. But I mean, yeah. Like, f- this this film could be a lot more violent, and it could be a lot more gory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it has gore in it, but the, a lot of the gore is, uh, or a lot of the violent is more. You're not looking at the violence happening; you're looking at the person's reaction to the violence, or happening. the person doing it, but in a, like a tighter shot on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing I so you're seeing like the blood splatter over yeah. them, but you're not seeing the actual pummeling of someone's skull. Yeah, I mean, what, what I was going to say, I was saying about um, Taylor Joy, what I like is that um, she, there's a little bit later on where she's literally wearing her headscarf, and I was like, oh, that she literally looks like her character from The Witch, and obviously she is a witch this time. So, uh, and obviously, her and Amleth left kind of get together, and uh, she starts joining him on his nightly campaign of terror, and what a campaign of terror it is. But before he gets started on this campaign of terror, the seer, the, uh, the other guy, who's got William Defoe's head, says, oh yeah, but you might want to get a sword. I mean, it's a, it's put a bit more eloquently than that, and he goes and he has to go venture into a, a a crypt somewhere nearby, and get. So yeah, this is this is the only thing that I'm a bit like I was a bit oh, okay because all of a sudden he's just like another location which is unspecified as to how we got there when he got there. Yeah, but David, he um, has to go there to how we managed anything like it was just unspecified. Well, and then he sort of just and then there's like yeah, there's this sword here, guys. You could just just fight this fight this dude in your mind or whatever. Happens. Well, that's what I was going to say. Um, there's Nightblade. The Nightblade. Yeah, because there's a chap. Nightblade. The, Nightblade. There's the next chap. The, the chapter when he starts, you know, going around and just like slicing people up for fun every night. The chapter is called. The Night Blade feeds. There's chapters, the chapter names. Yeah, cool. I really like the chapter names. What's the last chapter? Is it called The Gates of Hell? The Gates of Hell, yeah. yeah. But with one L, because, you know, to be more Norse. But, uh, yeah, I mean, when he got, when he, it, was, it almost felt like a side mission from the uh, Elden Ring video game when he had to go and get the sword. I was like, and, and like we said, does it even happen? Because, uh, well, there's a bit, I, I know you're going to get onto in a minute involving the sword, which I'll let you get to, but only. Because he pulls the sword out of this skeletal warrior, and then you have this big f- fight, and like it's this hulking giant skeleton dude, and he's you know getting the shit kicked out of him. But then he can he kind of beats the shit out of him. Yeah, but you know, does not he? But then he kind of he, he finally gets around to it, and he gets a big spear pole and uh, through the thing, gets the sword, and off comes the you know the uh, dusty head, or just more dust. And yet upon defeating him, the camera flashes back to him standing in front of the sword and this dude who's. Clearly, just a, well, it doesn't. It doesn't flash back. Does well, it, it just it tracks, it tracks around, and it just it the tracks back. Yeah, to it. and, and then, he does this a couple it's... of times in the film when the camera. And you were saying about this, yeah. but it almost he almost breaks what he does. He'll there'll be an action scene, and he'll break the line coming back round. It'll look like he's broken the uh, the line, but it makes sense because the action's kind of changed. If that if that makes sense, and like you say, and then he stood there with the sword, and he pulls it out of the guy's hand this time, and instead of a big fight, uh, it just crumbles to nothingness. So did it, like you said, did it happen or did it not happen? We don't know. Uh, but now he's got a really cool tool called the Nightblade. I think it happened. It was more like a, a, like a, like a more spiritual mind ritual that was happening. So what are you saying? It was some Vulcan it, Norse shit. Was, I, think it, I think he'd have died there if he'd have lost 
a fight. He'd have sort, but it wouldn't have. He, or he'd kind of just dropped down dead, or he wouldn't have been able to have grasped the sword. It was almost like the sword testing him. It was the sword. It was that's how I saw it. It was the sword testing him, and it was almost like an acceptance from from the sword. Did you feel at this point that? That bit especially felt a lot like the Green Knight. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was just like, and that kind of made me. I was like, oh, no, I can understand that. Well, like literally, like like, like the bit with the Green Knight where he walks in, he's like, oh, if you strike me, I can. Oh, actually, David, what I've got here is I have got best kill. Now we've got a few options here, and I'm gonna see which 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 one you agree with. I think I already know. I know I've got one in my, yeah. uh, straight away in yeah. my head. That's but it. before we, well, there'll be no best kill category if we just went straight to the best one. But we've got the guy who gets headbutted to death on a sports field. Um, obviously, we don't see the wreckage of his face, but he headbutts him a fair few times. So I'm imagining he's sometimes the imagination's more gory than the. Oh, um, and the sound, reality. the sound design makes it like the crunching and of bone and sinew, man. That's what just does it. One of my favourite ones is when the guy runs in and he well, kind of walks in with his entrails falling out. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Got, got to love <laughs> it. Good... Like it was almost <laughs> funny, wasn't it? It's like, oh, hey, hey entrails. Looks like a bunch of sausages. I mean, because it is. But I think, yeah, we both agree, David. The best kill in the film is the dude who got his, co- his nose cut off earlier. And his name literally is Thin the Nose Stub. Getting the night blade shoved right up through his face hole. Yeah, that was... Uh, that one. When that happened, I was just like... Oh. There was a lot... Sat forward a bit, like, yeah, that's all. That was a big wince moment. That was like a... That was like sucking your teeth in when like someone tells you how much something's going to cost to repair moment. That was like, ooh. Now, I think after that, we can get on to the twist. So, you know, he's uh, he's been killing people quite regularly and they're getting quite annoyed with it. So he's eventually now going to go and free his mum. And, well, that doesn't go well, David, at all, does it? Uh, it doesn't go well at all because we find out that... He kind of says, hey, mum. I'm, I'm, I'm going to kill Uncle. Uh, I, I can take your son, your, my stepbrother, yeah, if you want. And I'm going to save you. You're, you're, you'll be good. I'm go- I got this. To which Nicole Kidman replies. She was like, well, actually, I was kind of happy here. You. you know, yeah. You know. And it turns out that his dad and his the view we saw of him with uh, uh, Ethan Hawke at the start, he was a bit of a dick himself, actually. You know, he was off whoring all the time. And she actually wasn't a queen. She was a slave that he took a, a liking to, and she shows him his slave mark. Her slave, and he, sh- and she shows him. Well, she was uh, still a queen. Yeah, yeah. Well, she became a queen. I thought. I thought she was a slave who became a she queen. She originated as a slave. Yeah, yeah. She was just. She was like what Anna Taylor Joy was to um, Fjolnir, just somebody that he saw took a liking to her. Yeah, I'm gonna fuck her occasionally because yep. I can because I'm a fucking king. That's what happens. I'll just get to turn and turn up and rape all these women because. Fuck me, the past is a horrible place to live. Yeah. But yeah. Well, like you say, Fjolnir takes a little bit of a liking to Annie Taylor Joy. I mean, you know, who wouldn't? And she expertly is like, oh, well, actually, it's my time in a month, so no. And he's like, okay then. <laughs> so that, and, uh, and you, you like. And- oh, it's a little bit, a little bit more than that. She lifts it up, shows that there's blood smeared all over Blood smeared murking. And then picks this, picks like. Quite literally, the sort of like slops the blood up and uh, smears it all over his eyes and face, and he's just like, "Yeah, nah, ain't happening tonight." Eh? <laughs> I mean, yeah, such poetic words used there, David. Such poetic words. Um, but yeah, so it turns out that actually, King the the King uh, Amleth's dad was a bit of a wrong in himself, uh, and that if you look at kind of. He, it's kind of implied that he was uh, born of rape himself as well. So it's not really going well for him. And then, of course, she's now living on a farm. Yeah, yeah there's that moment, there's a realisation where the penny drops and he's just like his entire life's um, vengeance plan just gets thrown out, the thrown out, doesn't it? And he's just like, doesn't know how to react. He doesn't know what he's thinking. Does his purpose is... Is is his is existence meaningless now? Because well, David, it gets a bit worse for him, doesn't it? Oh, it gets dark. I mean, so at this point, he's like, okay, well, you know, we can forget about that. I'm gonna, I'm still gonna free you. And he's like, well, actually, I knew about it. I was having an affair with your uncle, and we planned to kill your dad because he was a dick. And we also gave the oh, by the way, well, it wasn't, it wasn't we planned. It was more she, she planned. Begged, she begged him. Yeah, yeah. She was the one. She was the instigator. She begged him to do she's it. She's a bit more. She's a bit of a. I mean, yeah, she is like the twisted fire starter, as it were, man. 
She is the instigator. And yeah, I mean, she is really the lady the Lady Macbeth of the piece, you know, to get in another Shakespeare reference. So you don't really see her much in it at all. She's like a little bit at the start. And then we don't really see her in a, t- a talk at all until this big scene. Uh, there's a couple of like lines here and there, but no, no, like, no major scenes. And arguably, this queen, uh, her character, Queen Gudrun, she is more of a menace than either two of her previous husbands. And that she's proved she will do whatever she can do to stay in power, even leading to propositioning her own son. Apparently, David, there was a couple of walkouts at that point, which I think actually says that more about the people leaving at that point, after hours of watching hideous violence, then a dodgy quick kiss. And clearly, they didn't watch Game of Thrones either. So he found out that his mum planned to kill his dad, which she did. And then he, she's like, oh, but you're really powerful now. Uh, yep, yeah, we could get together. And Not just killing his dad, kill him. Yeah, well, didn't that come afterwards? She wanted didn't him Didn't she tell him that afterwards? No, it was all in the same scene. No, I know it's all in the same scene, but I'm just trying to remember the order of it. Because like it, there's like another oh. domino and then another domino. So that's the first one. And the second one, I think she tries to kiss him and like bring him round to like, yeah, well, you know, you could be king and I could be queen. And, and he's like, no, that's a bit fucked as well. And then she's like, oh, well, by the way, I, I was the one to give the order to, you know, have you murdered as well. Because now she's got a stepson uh, who's one of uh, Fionnoy's older sons, I guess, from another relationship. See, you know, they weren't always completely backwards in the time, you know. And there was those. And own their own son, son the, li- the little dude. Same. Who really, who, who really, they was playing like this Nordic game of football, kind of, with sticks. And he ran on the pitch and absolutely got his... Sh- yeah, it was more like, um, it was more like, uh, what's it called? Um, lacrosse, I think. Or there's there's a version, There's an, I think there's an Irish version of lacrosse, which is quite... Danish death lacrosse. Yeah. So, obviously, understandably, having, after having his worldview shattered by his mum... He's actually, he goes in and he kills Fjolnoy's older son. And he's like, do you know what? I've had enough of this. I'm going to leave. But then as he's like out in the, like waiting for Olga to escape and joining, Fjolnoy's a bit annoyed, clearly, because, you know, his oldest son's been murdered in his sleep by Amleth. And he starts killing slaves and he gets up to Olga. And that's when Amleth appears and tells Fjolnoy, he is here for vengeance. Vengeance. And then he starts taking out a few of his men. But he actually gets captured. And I was like, I don't know. I mean, yeah, I was like, could that many people really stop him? Yeah, well, he, could, he, he weren't able to unsheath his sword, was That's it? That's what I was going to get to. Because his yeah. sword can't be unsheathed because he can't do it during the daylight. So he was fighting with an unsheathed sword. <sighs> yes, because it is the Nightblade. Uh, yeah, so um, he actually gets captured and he gets tortured. And but cleverly, Amleth, you know, he's he's not too he's not he's pretty sharp, man. <laughs> Ironically, because he's cut out Fiona's son's heart. Uh Fiona's poor son called Foria. And this is actually what keeps him alive, because uh Fiona is so distraught about him not being able to be buried properly because his heart's missing. And also the fact that Fiona um, also the fact that uh, Amleth is like, Well, I know I'm not gonna die here because I know exactly when I'm gonna die. I have to fight in a pit of hell uh before so that's not here. So he's kind of almost doesn't care because he knows that's not where where it's supposed to happen. And of course, what happens? Odin rocks up with some ravens and he gets freed. Odin looking suspiciously weirdly in this one, a little bit like Raiden from Mortal Kombat, which I thought was funny because you know you got like the, the hats and the stick and the you know the lightning and the the ravens. I was like, oh, I, yeah, yeah. Oh. Well, pre- preluding all of this. Preluding. Um, when he preluding, yeah. When he first goes on his little vengeance spree and kills just like random uh, guards and stuff, and he puts them all in a little horse-shaped corpse thing. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, that was pretty much the best way of describing it. He put he, he just arranges all of these bodily parts into the shape of a nice horse on um, on the side of a building. When he got time to do this without anybody seeing. It, pfft, any, any, I mean, I, I don't know, but uh, he did it uh, all by himself as well. Um, oh, he's a big dude. And I quite liked um, whether this was intentional or not. And I can't imagine it wasn't intentional because a lot of these stuff like the movies fought out to the to the nth degree at the moment, aren't they? Because there was a little there was a very small conflict of Christianity versus uh, the old like Norse ways, the old Norse gods in it. And a lot of the, um, because Christianity was very, very new at this point. Yeah. It was, this whole film's taking place in like 870 something AD, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. 
or maybe 900 AD, something around there. It's very, very lightly sketched. It's not really like a main plot point, is it? It's it's not no, it's not a main plot, no, but it but it is there. It's it is it's a part of the film because a lot of the slaves Christian, are Christian and they kill them and, because they're um, Norse. And and when they see this, when they see all the corpses displayed on this, they mention um they mention the slaves and they mention that Christ is uh the Christianity's worship a corpse nailed to a stake, essentially being or the cru- crucified on the sick. And I quite I found it quite interesting that the film was released on Good Friday. I'm just saying, with 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 the level of detail and the level of everything that goes into uh, movies these days, it wouldn't surprise me if that little little detail on its release date was uh, purposeful. So after Odin's turned up and with some ravens, and they've pecked away and uh, let let him go, and he's off. This time he escapes wounded, and would you believe it? Olga finds him and drags him out, but we don't really see that, do we? Because you see him kind of like get freed by the ravens and kind of I can't remember. Does he kind of stagger out the barn a little bit? Because uh, they come back and look for him and he's gone. And then it cuts to him chilling in a hot tub. Well, a hot, a hot spring, doesn't it? So Olga finds it because I think they said, oh yeah, I found you. And so he's like, he saved her once and now and she saved him once, which is nice. And, uh, you know, then they get, she climbs in the hot spring for more hot, sexy hot, hot springs times. And uh, they decide to, well, you know, get it on and then get on a boat to leave Iceland. Now... Well, they've been getting it on pretty, pretty, yeah. Well. They got it on in the after the uh, after the lacrosse. Thing. Well, there's a bit where they went out and they had their like naked, yeah, they dance. Had, they had sexy times. In they the had woods sexy times like. in the woods where they were dancing around a fire, and, like doing a bit. Of... Oh yeah, there was loads of sexy naked times happening there, weren't there? There was like a massive orgy. I forgot. About oh, so that. It looked like a slave orgy as well, didn't it? Because I didn't see any of the other ones. Yeah, there. it was like a, yeah. so, like you know, yeah, we're a slave, but also we're, you know we're, we're Christian slaves. But we also have our everybody. Li- we have urges, man. It's 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 all it's all natural. Well, what I was going to say is at this point, right? He's like he's killed Fiona's son, and he's realised his mum's in that job. He wants him dead. So you know, he's like, well, okay, perhaps I'll just leave my you know vengeance stuff away. And he's on the boat with Olga, and they're like, yep, yeah, okay, we're going to make a live it. Let's go somewhere else. And he's like, yep, yeah, I can probably become king somewhere, you know, because I'm I'm jacked, so I can like pretty much you know just go and murder people and become king. And if Olga hadn't just let him touch her stomach. They'd probably be, you know, somewhere else happy in Scandinavia. But nope, using his special Viking powers, Amleth touches his stomach and immediately knows she has twins. And then, of course, as long as Fiona is alive, that means his children will never be safe. And he jumps off the boat and swims back for final naked volcano vengeance. But first, he pops in to see his mum again. And she, obviously, being a bit of a nut job. Uh, this scene here, like, I honestly think Nick Kidman... Do you think she should get an Oscar nomination for it? It's very little screen time she has in the film. No, no. I mean, it's more than Judy Dench had in um, that uh, Victoria film or Elizabeth film that she did. But yeah, yeah, where she was in it for eight minutes. I don't think Nicole Kidman's in it for even eight. No, minutes, I, I think really, it's shorter, so probably not. Probably not. Yeah. But it was good, man. She just like she just just that she literally come in. It's like a mic drop performance. She's like she's just like in the background as window dressing for the few scenes she's in, and she comes in, goes full on batshit crazy, mic drop out. And then tries to stab her son. Well, she actually does stab her son. And then he has to, like, you know... I think I don't think there'll be any sort of performance... Um, you don't think Sarsgaard could get nominated? Because Sarsgaard's performance nah, is... Man. No, no, I don't. He was great, don't get me wrong, but I don't think they'll nominate him for performance. I think, that, if anything, that from an awards-related thing, this film... Direction? Uh, cinematography in it was... Uh, the cinematography yeah. was just outstanding. It was... On, it, honestly, it was gorgeous. So you think cinematography, I mean, writing, directing... It literally took every frame as a painting, seriously. You know, like, it's a saying. A lot of people say that, but fucking every, literally every frame was visually stunning. I'm going to slightly disagree, because I think Sarsgaard could get nominated. I don't think he's going to win anything for it. Just the physical... I thought you were going to disagree with the cinematography. No, no, no. I was like, fucking hell, you are. Get get ready for fisticuffs. Mate, mate, at the minute, the best two-looking films of the year is this and The Batman. And our old pal Grieg. This beats the Batman. This beats the Batman. Oh, I don't know, man. I got... this, is, this was... This was... This, this I've was... seen Batman twice in the cinema, and by this time next week, I will have seen The Northman twice in the cinema. So I'll... And from a cinema... From just a sheer beauty artistry standpoint, it beats the... They are, I know, I know. This, this was more my preference of, you know, subjective view on... It was... This was literally like an artist fucking painted half of the film. It was gorgeous. But they're completely different styles. Batman's very kind of film noirish and lots of neon and it's raining all the time. It's kind of conjures that thing. It's very 
set in that way with that kind of colour yeah, palette. Yeah, this was a lot of smoke, a lot of timber, a lot of ember, a lot of ash. Well, this was mo- a, a lot, lot more naturalistic the... looking, wasn't it? The lighting in it. Yeah, it wasn't as um, heightened. So they're completely different styles. Yeah. But, I mean, yeah, they're definitely the best two looking films of the year for me so far. Uh, so we're back in with, you know, uh, Amleth and his mum. And she's, you know, decided she just wants to murder him now. Uh, and she gives him a good old stabbing. And then he's obviously just defending himself. And obviously he throws his sword out. And, uh, yep, she's dead. She's dead. And, of course, what happens? Little stepbrother, he runs in. He's like, ah, mummy. He doesn't actually say that, but, you know. And he's got a little knife as well, which is cool. And he jumps up and starts stabbing him multiple times in the back. And, again, he's just trying to... F- yeah, oh, I know. I mean, he's, why? how the fuck did you not just stab him in the neck at that point? And then it's game over. Yeah. End yeah, of the yeah. film. A, Roll credits. I mean, because... Th- that little boy, you'd think he'd know And better. then it'd be like, and he grew up to be... And like, oh, we didn't see that coming. Yeah, that'd be a twist. Yeah. <laughs> but, no, instead, Amleth throws him off and pretty much just throws him on the end of his sword, really. And, yep, he's just killed his stepbrother and his mother. And he did seem a little remorseful about killing the step. Well, yeah, because he's a kid. I feel like I feel like he wasn't because he do saw that, himself in him, didn't he? You know, he saw. Yeah, there was definitely. Like de- yeah, exactly. This is what he was like before. Arguably, if the kid had lived, I, I don't know whether Sarsgaard meant to kill him. I don't think he did. But if he had, that would have been your sequel, there, wouldn't it? You know, he's going to hunt down the guy who killed his mother and father. They, they made a mistake. Awful made a mistake there, didn't they? Norseman too. Yeah, that would too been fast, too sequel. Norse. Norseman 2, Electric, Igloo. Oh, that was terrible. But then Fjornor walks to the door and he's obviously a bit annoyed because he's just had both his sons murdered and his wife now. But instead of fighting there and then, they're like, I will meet you at the gates of hell. Which obviously is a volcano. Because, you know, why not? And that, of course, takes us... He to... casually just drags out Nicole Kidman's corpse. Yeah, just leaves her at the... <laughs> and a kid and just... One-handed dragging her out. Just, yeah. just leaves him in the volcano and he's like, okay, cool. Yeah. Barry sorts like sorts out the little burial, slices his horse's head off. Oh yeah, forgot about the horse. Off up the volcano yeah. he goes. Oh, and there was one other animal death that really upset you, David. The dog dying. The dog dying made this go from a five star tomb to a zero star. Don't talk bollocks. Dogs die in movies, especially Viking movies. No, yeah, and then every movie they die in, it's a zero star film. <sighs> Look, I, look, what do you want? An award from Peter? No, you're not going to get. No, that. You get zero stars. Fucking do you, you know, is negative. Do you know, it's not a real dog, David, that gets murdered. I don't care. It made the sound. <laughs> it made the thing sound. Yeah, well, it was trying. It, it was trying to attack Amleth. So dies, or when it's scared, when it's <sighs> being hurt. My God, you can tell you've got a puppy, it's can't you? Zero stars. Right. Well, after David stopped talking bollocks, let's get to final naked volcano vengeance and. I guess, like we said, um, why were they naked? I mean, was it just really hot because they're in a volcano? Did it really happen? Uh, you did mention about the sword only being used at night. Well, it was day when he walked in, but then it was dark inside. How does that work? Yeah, well, when he... I, 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 so I think that the fight that we witnessed, mm-hmm. that we were shown on camera, wasn't the actual fight that took place, or it wasn't the fight that... Um... Because when you, when you, yeah, when he, because why the fuck, yeah, because they're all of a sudden they're all naked. I feel like that's the more religious, re- ritualistic fight that happens more within their own minds than the actual fight that took place. Because after he unsheathed his sword, he opened up the gates of hell. And that's what probably killed them both. And then they're in the gates, then they're in hell fighting each other in this other plane, almost, you know, this other plane of existence, which is happening. So they're in, what, what did you say in hell was called? Nilfgaard? No, Nilf- Nilfenheim, no. which is like their version of hell. Nilf- Nilfenheim. Um, yeah, so that's probably, that's what I think was happening. And then the naked fights where they're all, where they both turn into action figures uh, with very <laughs> smooth, um, with very smooth testicular areas. Yeah, because um, friend of the pod, uh, Chef Pirate Kate on Twitter, said asked us on on, on our, our Twitter page a little while ago. Does so? I heard Sarsgaard hangs dong in this one, and she's literally just messaged no. while we were recording this, David, saying, "So did he or didn't he?" And like he said, "No, he's like Action Man. He's very smooth. He's like Action Man or GI Joe or whatever. You know, he's just he's just smooth, smooth as a Ken doll." I was a bit disappointed by that, to be honest. I kind of, not that I wanted to see Dong, but the fact that I didn't see any sort of hanging penises or any sort of little ball sacks sort of twirling here and there <laughs> made me, I don't know, you know, you when you don't see something that you'd expect to see when people are fighting and there's like that. I scene, mean, yeah. Does that, do you know what I mean? Does that take it out of you a little bit for me when you see, when you see something I mean, that's obviously been 
remove. <laughs> I wasn't like you needing to see the dude's penis, today. Well, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't need to see it. It weren't like heroin, you know. Where I'm there, just like, oh man, I'm having like, you know, shakes because I'm not seeing any penises. <laughs> but when when you when there are like, and they're fighting and they're action figures, it does sort of, you know, it, it made it. Yeah. That's another reason why I felt like it was happening more in another plane because it was it was just so sort of ultralistic and fantasy. Like this this fight, it it felt. Let's talk about one thing about this fight. We we said about you know how did it happen? Did it happen? Where where did it happen? And all the metaphysical stuff. Who did you think was going to win? Going into it, because when it started, I did. I thought exactly what was going to happen happened. I thought they they do a rocky, they do a rocky, yeah, they, double they knockout. both kill each other. Yeah, I wasn't one hundred percent on that because I thought at one point that actually, because it's weird how as the film goes on, you kind of I think I think Klaus Bang's performance as Funor is really good because you start empathizing him with him a lot more. Like he tried to become king, kind of didn't. Now he's a farmer in the middle of nowhere. His slaves don't like him. But he generally seems quite a decent guy, bar you know the odd slave murder or trying to rape a slave girl. Yeah, that's that's what that's the uh, part of that didn't make sense. Why Odin was favouring Amleth, um, Amleth's and his quest yeah. for vengeance over and his quest for bloodshed over Fjolnir. Um, what Fjolnir was doing. But then again, I, I suppose guess, it's because Fjolnir uh, killed his Odin brother. Odin was maybe a kind of I don't know a lot about Odin as a god. Maybe he was quite a chaotic god, uh, and that was something that he wanted to see. It, you know. Maybe he, I don't know if Odin's like God that we have in Christianity, where it's like, you know, he's benevolent, this benevolent being. If you remember from the last Thor movie, uh, from Ragnarok, remember when Halla turns up, uh, Thor's um, half sister, and yeah. she's like, no, Odin used to be like a dick back in the day. He like, he literally locked me away because we were murdering too much. And then he decided to not yeah, be. Yeah, so know, Odin know... was no. It's definitely, definitely not like a nice benevolent god. Yeah, I know more about Greek mythology than I do about um, Norse mythology because I know Zeus was a bit of a dick. You know, he went down and slept with humans and hoard and created chaos all around him. So it wouldn't surprise me that Odin did that specifically just to create the chaos. Mate, mate, they're all variations on a the theme. Provided. Let's face it, all these kind of classic mythologies and histories and mythical stories, they're all just variations on a theme to a point aren't they every religion or um society from the past they all have their own versions of gods and you've got poseidon and you've got aquaman for example uh, that's a joke uh but yeah they've all kind of got the similar similar versions of it but i um, i actually thought when it came to the fight at the end i thought do you know what i i kind of wanted fjolnir to win because amleth he's done so much worse than fjolnir actually did Ten- really if you look at it you know but then again, we don't know what Fjolnir did earlier on before. Fjolnir probably had his like berserking days back with Ethan Hawke back in the day, hey? Yeah, and it wasn't just his dad that he killed. You know, he, there was that woman that was chucked off of the um, the fort when he was going back to tell his mum what had happened, and she's just a dead, you know. And then the whole fort, everyone there got raped and killed or whatever, didn't they? But David, for a, a Norse epic, for a spectacularly violent and brutal film, we kind of get a happy ending. Because we see all the Valkyries taking him to Valhalla. And he gets a vision of Olga with his two kids and cut to black, the Northman. So, happy ending? I mean, as happy as it's going to get, really, to be fair, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. we all knew that's kind of... He got he got the he got the, uh, the Viking death that he, he wanted. wanted. He wanted to die with sword in hand on the duel to the death. Battle. And he got it. Which, if you're going to go, that's how you want to go. On a naked fighting in a volcano against a man who killed I mean, your father. there's a story to tell when you're up there fighting the Great War. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I don't think they fight a Great War up there, man. I think they just hang out and drink mead all day. No, isn't that isn't that the whole point of Valhalla? The Valhalla, the, you're fighting the eternal battle with... I thought Valhalla was no, just like this. No, I thought Valhalla uh, was a battlefield. Yeah. And you're fighting an eternal war of the... No, of the that's gods. that's the other one um, that I mentioned earlier. Frey, Freya takes people to the battlefield, to this field. And the other half get to chill out at Valhalla. Okay. I think I mate, we don't know enough about Norse mythology. We'll go and read Neil Gaiman's book again, and then um, we'll know what we're talking about. But I'm not going to dive too far into that because I clearly don't know what I'm talking about, other than watching some episode of Vikings, reading some of Neil Gaiman's book, and watching this film. So uh, I've got one little Northman fact for you here, David, because I've been listening to quite a few pods and interviews with the cast over the last couple of days. And uh, did you ever watch True Blood, David? Uh, yeah, I watched True Blood. Yeah, with him in it. Yeah. He was awesome, actually. He was pretty cool. That, well, that, that's the show that really launched him, wasn't it? Yeah. Back in the day. 
Well, the Scar Scar, the whole fucking family are annoyingly talented. Well, yeah, Stellan, uh, what's the other? Bill Sar. Everyone forgets Peter Sarsgaard's one of them yeah. as well. Do you remember what his character was called in True Blood? Um, oh, I do. It was Eric, I think. Yeah. Eric? Yeah. Do you know what his surname was? Northman. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And Skarsgård actually credits the show with giving him the idea to pursue a fully-fledged Viking film because he said, uh, I think it happens in season three of True Blood and there's flashbacks to Eric's time before. And it turns out he's actually the son of a Viking king called Ulfric Northman and that he was actually a Viking before he becomes a vampire in the show. So yeah, even and if you want an even bit more of a synchronicity with the film, his family in the show is torn apart by werewolves. <laughs> And um, Sarsgaard said, he goes, even though, they, you know, he goes, we were filming in like somewhere in California. So clearly it's not, you know, you know, Scandinavia, but and it was only for a couple of weeks. But he's like that just placed the idea that I want to do that full Viking film at some point. And he's actually I didn't realize he's actually kind of one of the main producers on the film as well. And it was only when he met uh, Robert Eggers that they like, right, yeah, let's do it, man. Let's, let's get it going. And he finally got to tell this tale. So, uh, in conclusion, I really hope this film finds its audience because for me, it's a stone cold five star masterpiece of a film that, despite the larger budget, still absolutely feels like an extension of Egger's previous films, just on a larger scale and palette. It's most definitely not this generation's gladiator, like the posters proclaim, because it. I think this has more of a nuance to why, it. Why it has a bit more mysticism need to, be to it compared to something else? Why can't a film be its own original? of his own original being what was the gladiator this season's chariots of fire you know but no but gladiator was yeah it was likened to all the old classic films why, like. why does we need to do that the reason is people don't go and see original films anymore not big audiences it has to be a sequel it has to be a remake it has to be a reboot any of that stuff right so by comparing this and i don't blame the film studio and even eggers for it at all if you make Gladiator, but again, again, Gladiator was what twenty-two years ago, two thousand Gladiator came out in, right? So there's not really. I mean, we then you kind of had a spate of films like that, didn't you? You had um, Kingdom of Heaven that Scott did next. You had Troy, and then that kind of passed again for a few years till Game of Thrones came out. And um, then, like you say, we've kind of um, we've kind of got to this stage now. But well, I think. It isn't like Gladiator at all. It's only like Gladiator in its barest, simplest part in that it's a revenge story of someone wanting to avenge his family's death. And it's not even really his whole family. Like Gladiator, it's his wife and son. In uh, this, it's just his dad. So it's not even, you know, and that's literally where they diverge. That's what I said. This really feels much more like, and what's good, because I've, I've read stories online. that Gladiator said, or this? Oh, this, hands down. Because again, Gladiator is I don't know, Gladiator's a, good a traditional. Film as well. I don't know, Gladiator. So for me, again, Gladiator is a five star classic of a film. It's one of my dad's favourite films. I've bought it film. every time it's come out on DVD. Russell Crowe's defining performance. It launched Joaquin Phoenix. This again, film, that was this one of the film first will probably up. be Alexander Starsgard's defining performance. I think this well, is as good as it I, gets I, for I, him in his career. And that's because he's still young. I mean, he's still got a lot of films to do. But I think this will be the one where people, if, if it finds its audience, will be what he's remembered for. That's the big thing. I and mean, we won't know for a couple of weeks uh, how yeah. well it's done because it doesn't come out in America until, like you say, uh, this time next week from when we're recording this. But um, I, I, I just really want it to do well because if it doesn't, it means you get less films like this. You get less original, you know, it means like Ari Aster might not get the money to make his next big weird horror film. Uh, and you, this is what you want, man. You want original films. I mean, I say original. It's not really original. It's just a retelling of Hamlet, really, isn't it? But a modern-day brutal version. Well, it's not modern-day. It's a, bit a newly made version uh, interpretation of the original source material. So even this isn't really an original film, if you look at it that way. You know, I mean, you get into the whole physics of it, you know, any uh, classic literature thing. But then you can go even further and go, well, look, there's only seven types of story. And you get all back into the whole classic screenwriting structure stuff. But we'll leave that to the side. But what I'm saying is the Northman gives absolutely no quarter in taking time to explain the law of Vikings and its surrounding mysticism. As I mentioned at the start of the pod, I, I was okay with this because I've seen all the seasons of Vikings and I get the references. But if you've never watched a Viking movie or show before, you're going to be wondering, like I said, what the hell's going on there? What's that big tree? Um, so uh, for me, David, so far, Eggers is free for free in classic films. And I have just pre-ordered the very 
very nice looking special edition 4K of The Witch. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, no, Eggers, out Eggers, Eggers is smashing it out of the park. He's already become one of those directors, which is amazing to do after just two films where people would go and see The Northman specifically because Eggers directed it. Um, which is incredible if you think that he's only done two films and he's already established himself as one of those where he can, he's, you know, he's yeah. a, a name that people will recognize and he's a style that people understand and that he is a, uh, a fucking auteur. He's an auteur. Auteur, yeah. mate. He's an auteur. It's funny, isn't it? Because people say about how auteur theory uh, has kind of gone by the wayside and like big studios like Marvel, they don't go for it. It's not the director's vision. It's Kevin Feige's vision. And all that. But we've got, uh, you've still got quite a lot of young auteurs coming out, man. You've got people like Damien Giselle coming out. You've got Ari Aster. I'm trying to think of other ones. Um, you know, you've, you've always got Paul Thomas Anderson. You've always got Wes Anderson. You haven't got Paul W.S. Anderson because he makes terrible Resident Evil films. But, you know, generally, if you've got Anderson and you're a director, you're generally pretty good. And there's lots more of, like, up-and-coming filmmakers, man, that are out there uh, that are, are... They need... You need to be... You need films like this. You need films that are uncompromi- uncompromising and brutal and just different from what the average thing you see. And... uh that's why I say I really hope this hits, man. I really hope this hits. And of course, I think once Ariaster's Disappointment Boulevard comes out, we can then do a proper head to head, David. And we can hit Asta yeah, versus yeah. Eggers. You mentioned this, uh, doing an Asta versus Eggers. Yeah, I mean, this this film, The, the, the Northman, can't really be described as a horror. I mean, the only horror really in it is the horror of fucking how brutal history was, you know, the sacrifices that they were making, um, the sheer. Yeah, brutality of the time that they were living. I mean, uh, the, which is, which is kind of the most historic, like ho- horrific thing is people like all you got to do is look at our own fucking history and it's filled with darkness. You know? I mean, I, I I think all these films are horrors. The light the lighthouse is a much more Lovecraftian weird weird Lynch fever yeah. dream. Uh, the witch is a lot of build yeah. up and build yeah, up and build up, and you're not burn, really yeah. sure what happens. That, but again, they're very different styles from Asta. That's good, man. You don't want everyone to be uh, carbon copy clone. No, but of each I don't other. think this you is want a differences horror film. Like I think getting. this is this was Robert Eggers maybe branching out of the um, uh, maybe branching out of that stereo. Is, is, it, is it, it? Where do you know when you're? Um, what's the word called? I've forgotten the word. Edgar Wright just did it, didn't he? We last yeah, night in Soho. Well, His first out and out horror film. What's it called? That when you're pigeonholed. Developing your style when into a into a certain genre of film is that it? Oh fuck it, I don't know. But anyway, yeah, he was spreading his wings. Well, David, I I think I get the feeling that I'm going to be Team Eggers, and I think you're going to be Team Master. So we'll uh, we'll do our prep work well, this, and we'll have a nice little amazing, smackdown. The Northman, um, it's five, like I said, five star masterpiece of a film. But the um, but if you're comparing The Witch versus Hereditary, and then if you're going to compare. Um, Midsummer, Midsummer against the to lighthouse, the lighthouse, then and it's Asta wins both times. But Disappointment Boulevard's gonna have to be f- fucking amazing to be better than the North. Right, well that's all the time we have. So I'm off to consume some meat, drink some mead. Or well, David, you're gonna do battle with the beast at the gates of hell, Garm. Do you think Cheddar will get his Viking on and fight at the gates of hell, or does his, does his killer instinct just extend to barking at the neighbours as they leave the house? No, Cheddar's become a bit of a sex pest. He's, um, he's, he's he's going through a bit of a phase, so that's that's the struggle at the moment. Well, a little bit a little bit like some of the characters in Northman, and you know what they say, David, dogs are like their owners. And we'll see you next time. We needed roads.